It is good to be in the house of God. Amen. God bless these two young girls um, who also participated, I believe, in, in the general uh, word that God, I believe, is trying to speak to us as a church, uh, God being faithful. Amen. Uh, what a nice song. That God makes uh, beautiful things. He redeems to make beautiful things out of uh, broken pieces, out of dust, uh, out of us. As we are, as broken people many times look and, and seem as dust, but he redeems us uh, and he makes us something beautiful. And that adds on to the theme that I believe that God uh, is trying to speak to us, just like Father Valet also added on and also Andy at the beginning added on with, it, with his psalms. God is a faithful God, amen. And I believe that in, in, uh, in this service tonight, God is speaking to us in this way, reminding us in a sense, uh, ironically on Father's Day, that he is a faithful father. Amen? And it's like the song that we sang and also the psalm. I really like the psalm that Andy, Andy read in the beginning of the service. Uh, the one that, that it said, that when I cry out to God, what, is, what does he do? He responds to us. When I'm surrounded by my enemies, what is it? he delivers us. And I, I like that, that part where it said, even when they laugh, aha, aha, he still works and he still responds and he delivers us. And the song that we sing, that he is faithful. And to repeat that, that he is faithful. And I don't know who needs this message uh, tonight. Clearly, God is trying to speak to someone tonight and speak to us as a church. Uh, no matter where you are at right now with him, with God, no matter where you're at in your current situation, maybe at work, maybe spiritually, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your family, God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful, and because God is faithful, oh, he deserves the praise. Oh, he deserves the honor. Oh, he deserves the glory. And I, I believe that, that, that we should not be shy or timid to give him that praise and to give him that honor. Amen. Amen. But then it begs to, uh, to respond to that in a sense. I was in my chair, and as I was worshiping, it was as if the Lord was, was speaking to me about this, this message, faithfulness. And <clears throat> It, I, I almost responded, okay, God, uh, you are faithful, but what does this like, mean to me? And, 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 and God asked me, how much are you willing to be faithful if I am faithful until the end? If, if, if I am faithful until the end, how much are you willing to go and be faithful to me, to my promises, to my call, to my voice? How much are you willing to go for me? Because I went all the way. And, and I stood in my chair and I thought, God, many times I deny you. Uh, many times I, I, I say, God, why me? Why this? Why this situation? Why this circumstance? But God never gave up on us. He never failed us. He remained faithful. But how much are we willing to remain faithful to him? May God be glorified in all things. Amen. <clears throat> I have a little bit of a longer passage, um, so you guys may maybe uh, stay seated as I read the word of God. Uh, we find it in, in James chapter 3, uh, if you would please open up with me, and if we could please put it on the screen. It's James chapter 3, and I'll be starting from verse 1, and it says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that... Who, that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to brittle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rubber, whatever they will, the, whatever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among the members, straining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brother. These things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth the same... Does a spring 
forth from the same opening fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives and grapevine produce figs? Neither can salt ponds yield fresh water. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and self-ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes, from, that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and self-ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Amen. It's, it's funny because I remember clearly uh, several years ago, I was taking a preaching class, exegetical preaching was the class's name. And uh, when our, our teacher was giving us out verses, uh, he had a hat and he put you know, little slips with verses on it. And, and he said he prayed when he was uh, uh, choosing the text that, that it may be you know, God's will, every text that is uh, being written down and, and preached upon. And then we prayed as a class as well that God may give us the right text for every single person. Uh, and I remember that I, I got uh, a James chapter 3, verses 13, all the way to the end of the chapter, verses 18. And in my studies that I, that I had to uh, prepare, um, I had to also kind of dig deep on, on in how uh, chapter three, the beginning of chapter three connects to the end of or the second part of, of chapter three. And I remember in my class, man, thank God that I'm not preaching from verses one to 12. And, and I, I said, I hope I never have a chance to preach from that because that's too, too hard of a word. It's too hard of a, uh, of a message for me to preach. I, I don't want to upset anybody. And I find myself several years later uh, doing the exact, that exact thing. Uh, God putting on my heart, you know, speak from this word. Um, and it's funny because every single time that God tells me to speak uh, from a specific word, it is usually him trying to speak to me first. It's usually him trying to direct me first. And we see this powerful word in James chapter 3. Uh, the, the taming of the tongue. Also, I believe the power of the tongue. Uh, the power that we have as, as the body of Christ with the words that we speak and the things that we say, maybe even the prayers that we pray, uh, there is power in that specifically. And what inspired me to, to in, in a sense, uh, choose this passage and to speak about this uh, was earlier this year when we had the Ruinta. Um, I, I remember I, I mentioned this earlier in a prayer hour that we had um, about the power of our words and, and how God was really speaking to me at the power of our words. And I'm going to uh, go back and kind of retell that, that experience that I had. I remember right here in this corner when we were praying with, with those young boys, I think it was uh, Chris, uh, Danny, and Jesse, uh, and it was just the, the young guys that were there that were really hungry for the Holy Spirit. And I remember I was praying with Chris Kata specifically, and, and as I was kind of like helping him in prayer, um, of course, I, I was hearing exactly what he was saying and how he was praying to God with a, like an honest and, and sincere heart. And he was saying uh, such bold statements. God, just take my life. Take everything. God, use me for whatever you want to do. God, take control. Do. He was like just proclaiming his whole life before God. Um, and, and, and at that moment when I was listening to him speak, it was as if I saw myself. 16 years old, 17 years old, when I was also doing studying for the Holy Spirit, uh, saying the exact same things. Uh, and and it, it almost like touched me and in a sense shocked me. And God said, look, remember, remember when you were like that? Remember when you were a young guy, um, full of passions, full of you know, rebellious ways in a sense. You had so many ideas, so many things you wanted to do. And then I came into your life and then, and then you started saying these, in a sense, crazy things. Uh, these big, bold statements. And then, and then God kind of nudged me in, 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 in my heart and said, uh, you said those things and you proclaimed those things back then. But then how come you ask me why and how come you ask me how come these things and these things and these things and, and why do I have to do this and why do I have to do this? And he was kind of nudging me. Remember when, when, when you said those things and then he pointed back. Remember when you were 16? R remember that prayer? Remember that time when you came before me at the altar many times and you say, God, I don't care what I do. I just want to serve you. I don't care where I go, God. I just want to go after you. And he said, remember that? He said, he said, I'm a faithful God. 
And, and, and I keep track of every single thing that you said. And I, at that moment, I, I, kind of, I kind of broke down in prayer and I said, wow, God, you, you blow me away. Kind of things started to come, uh, make sense and to click. And, 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 and I, I was in a sense encouraged, but at, at the same time, I was a little bit scared. Like, wow, all the prayers that I've prayed up until now, God, uh, have mercy in a sense, have mercy. But I have this message prepared specifically for the young youth uh, the ones that are, that are maybe praying these bold prayers and, and, and saying these powerful things. Uh, and, and I want to bring to our attention, there is power in the words that we say. There is authority and power in the words that we say. And we don't just speak empty words or powerless words. Everything that we speak is actually taken, is actually recorded, and God sees it, and God weighs it. The first point in this message we find in the beginning of the text when James says, uh, when he says, not many of us should become teachers. Why? Because the tongue, he said, is a world of unrighteousness. And he says, he warns us by, by, by the greatness or great power of the tongue and exactly what the tongue can do uh, for us and in us and through us. And he said, not many of, of us should become teachers because uh, those who can uh, handle the tongue or control the tongue, that's a perfect person. Many of us have stumbled, but that can, I can control the tongue as a perfect person. Man, nobody is perfect, and nobody can control this tongue. But this tongue, the damage that it does or the power that it does, first we see in the examples that James has uh, later on in chapter 3. He says, first, we find that, the, that we have the power to influence those with the tongue, with our words that we say. He says over here, he uses the example uh, of the bit that you put in the, in the horse's mouth. And that when you place that bit in the horse's mouth, in a sense, you influence him. In a sense, you have control over him. In a sense, you, you kind of guide him and, and, and direct him. You have a, a sort of authority over that horse when you place that bit in his mouth. And the same way when we speak words, when we, when we profess things maybe upon others, upon those around us, in a sense, our words have the power to influence, influence those around us. Did you know that you guys are influencers? You youngins. I like to say that word, you're youngins. You guys are influencers. Regardless uh, if you realize that or not, I realize that in my life that many times I don't see exactly who is looking at me, but I'm doing something and somebody has their eyes on me and, what is Nate doing? And me, I'm not just, I'm, not, I'm like a regular guy. But even you guys, as, as young as you guys are, maybe there is a, a younger one or, or someone that is looking towards you. And what is, what is that? How is he cutting his hair? How is, how is she doing her makeup? How is she curling her hair? And they, they kind of, uh, you are, in a sense, an influencer upon them. Uh, there's this uh, funny uh, kind of situation. I, I love to talk about my nephews. I learned, I learned a lot about my nephews. Um, and... Before I share the message about Ezra, I now want to share a message about Isaiah. Isaiah is a, is a very strong-willed, very strong-willed child. He's a copy of my dad, uh, the exact copy of my dad. A very strong-willed, very, uh, you, you cannot, con if, if he has his mindset on something, you cannot convince him otherwise. And uh, his parents had trouble potty training him. As, as, a, as a young man, he did not like the toilet because he didn't like it. Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what you do. I, I don't want to go on the toilet. I'm fine with my pampers. I'm fine with my diapers. And we started making fun of him. No, no, Zay, Zay, you're, you're a baby because you keep on going on your diapers. You're, you're not a big boy. Man, he would get so angry. No, 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 I'm a big boy. Okay, if you're a big boy, then go, go on the toilet. If you're a big boy, then do what you're supposed to do as a big boy. And we were struggling. His parents were struggling with him for a while. And after a while, he finally had the courage to do it. No longer uses diapers, no longer, he, he's, he's potty trained. And now, up until now, he's been, he's been saying it with so much pride, I'm a big boy. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big boy. And he carries that around and everything, yes, I'm a big boy. See, but what started him or what encouraged him or pushed him in, in a sense to change was the words that we were saying to him. We were saying, listen, um, Isaiah, if you want to be a big boy, you have to do these things. Uh, if, if you want to uh, hold the title of a big boy, you have to start doing this, this, and this, and this. In a sense, we're influencing him to become a big boy. In a sense, the same way we, when we speak words to those around us, when we say specific things to those around us, we are influencing them, even if we like it or not. 
Uh, maybe sometimes when we uh, exclude somebody or, or, we, or, or we act in a certain way, uh, those around us, they, they see those things. Maybe when we call someone uh, not cool or, or ugly or, man, like you, you're weird, that, that, that thing impacts those around us. And there is power in the things that we say. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. It is important that what we use these lips is not for negative things, is not for, uh, 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 in a sense, uh, discouraging things. It says in the word of God that we are to use, as believers, as children of God, we are to use our lips to what? To impart grace, to impart life, to impart hope. And I want to ask uh, also the, the young youth that, that are here, uh, what exactly do we betray in our lives, in ourselves? How exactly do we influence those around us, us as influencers? Do you influence them towards Christ, those around you? Maybe at school, maybe um, at work, if some of you guys work, or wherever you guys are at. Are you guys influencers for Christ or influencers for this world? Because the things that we say, the things that we do, they, put, they, they carry a message, they carry weight, and that also impacts those around us. But the word of God encourages us, listen, if you will speak, speak something that edifies, speak something that builds, speak something that, that builds those around you, that strengthens those around you, because that's what believers are supposed to do, amen? You know, uh, there's an evidence, in a sense, a, a, a way to check ourselves if we are good influencers or not in this world. The way that we can, that we can check or, 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 or in a sense verify that we are good influencers, true Christ-like influencers, is that we have, must examine exactly what is, what is around us. What lies around us. Are we surrounded by death? Maybe broken relationships? Maybe angry people? Are we surrounded by maybe uh, uh, just, just, just darkness and, 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 and death and, and ruin? Or are we surrounded by life? Because that is a true mark of a Christian influencer is that we portray life, we bring life to those around us, and that no matter who comes close to us, they have a taste of hope. They have a taste of grace. They have a taste of faith. They have, they have a, they have a, it, it, there's life, and, and it, everyone flourishes around us because we influence them towards the life giver. Amen. How are we influencing those around us? Because the words that we say and the things that we do have the power to influence as we see in this passage. We see the second example that, that James uses over here. Uh, first, he talks, about, uh, he, he talks about the bit in the, in the horse's mouth, the way that he influenced, but then he goes back and he says, we'll, we'll take this in consideration about the ships. And, and, and this is also an, an interesting way of putting it. He says the ships, even though they're so great, uh, they weigh so much, they're loaded with so much stuff, so much treasures, and they're driven by such a strong wind, the direction... Uh, the way that it turns, the way that it goes, is directed by a small piece of rubber. And a, a small piece of rubber is directed by the, by, by, by the one that, the, the pilot, the one that drives it, he drives the boat exactly, no matter how much weight, no matter how long it is, no matter how big it is, no matter how strong the winds are, it's that small piece of rubber and that, 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 that driver that directs the boat. And we have the power of destination uh, through our words, through our lips. The power of destination. It is important to understand one thing. Uh, our words and our commitments define and direct us to our destination. The, what we say, what we speak, the prayers that we make, that influences or, or that impacts our destination. Amen? Doesn't matter uh, how big our lives are, what we say, it can impact that. Doesn't matter how big our calling is, the way that we speak or the things that we do, the actions that we make can impact, that can direct us to our destination. Oh, this is a powerful point, and this is something that, that I think that our generation really needs to understand. What we say will enable us or disable us to do God's will in our lives. What we say and what we do can enable us, can give us strength, possibilities, open doors, or disable us. Lock us down, cage us down to do God's will. It is very important the way that we speak and the things that we say, the prayers that we make even, exactly how we pray. Because that it, that it allows us to do what God wants us to do. The power of our words. 
In Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 to 37, um, it is when Jesus addresses the Pharisees when they were uh, talking amongst themselves and, and, and almost uh, uh, going against Jesus. And it says over here, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruits. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of a good treasure of his heart forth brings good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men shall speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and also by your words you will be condemned. Uh, there is such an, a, a weight to this passage, to this truth, that we as young youth must realize and also as a church must realize. Every word that comes out of our mouths, everything that we say, what happens? It is written down. It is not just forgotten in the abyss of this world or, or just thrown away like whatever. No, no, no. Uh, there is, a, a, every word that we said is kept track. And it says over here, Jesus says very importantly that on the day of judgment, you yourself will, will make yourself justified by the words that you say or will put yourself to be condemned by the words that you say based on what you say, based on about how you speak and, and what you do. And it gives us an accountability about, about the way that we act, the things that we say, the things that we do. Not one word we speak is forgotten but recorded and weighed. Amen. I, I think of this example that I, that I had in a, in a sermon once in Numbers chapter 13. It is when uh, spies were sent to spy on the promised land when Egypt, when, when Israel came uh, and right before the promised land, they went to go spy on it. And when the spies came back, interestingly enough, they said, yes, it is true what God said, that this land is flowing with milk and honey. It is a beautiful land. It is, it is a great land in a sense. But what we saw there were also big people. There, there were huge people. And we know for sure that if we go into that land, even though what God has said is true up until now, they will devour us. And there was a, a key word that they said, that those who enter into that land are devoured by that land. Those are the, the false reports that those people brought up to um, the rest of the, the group, Israel, that were wandering uh, to the promised land. And there was two faithful ones that said, no, 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 that's not true, that's not true. But the people decided to listen to the false witnesses. That, that those who enter will be devoured by the land, will be devoured by the land. And it is funny because God, when he saw that they didn't have faith and they didn't believe in his word and all that, that God has spoken, he said that what happened to those people that didn't believe? They went 40 years, 40 years in the desert. And what did God say? No, no, you will not taste of the promised land. You will not taste of the promised land. And they died one by one in the desert 40 years. Why? Because they believed in the lie that, that, that those who enter that land will be devoured. What they said, those lies that they said, actually became the reality, if we think about it. The words that they spoke became the reality. Understand that, young youth, that is very important. Very, very important. They said, listen, I'm not going to go in there. I don't have the faith. I don't believe that God is going to deliver us. So what happened is they died. And so many times when God is maybe calling us to a specific calling to a great work and we say, no, 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 God, I, I, I'm, I'm too small, I'm unqualified. And we repeat those lies and those thoughts in our mind and our hearts, what happens? Those lies and those things that are, that are in our hearts and our mind, they become our reality. They become truth when we, we in a sense, convince ourselves or direct ourselves to that destination. You understand how that, that connects? When we believe the lies the devil puts in our hearts and in our minds, that we are not good enough. Maybe that we don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve God's faithfulness. That we are wicked and, and, and maybe there's so many wicked things that I can name from this pulpit. I don't want to even touch that. But many times the devil comes with lies in our minds and in our hearts and we begin to profess that over ourselves. That will become our destination. That will become our reality. Because the words that we say upon ourselves has power over ourselves has power over ourselves. There is uh, an, an interesting part of, of, of Brother Puyu, uh, I'm, I'm sure that many of you guys know about this brother, this prophet. Uh, for, the, for the young ones that might, might not know about it, there is this, uh, this brother that I had a chance to minister with, he's blind. Uh, but God reveals to him uh, specific prophecies for the church, uh, and he has a, a powerful ministry. 
And what fascinates me about this, 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 this prophet's ministry, about his life, his testimony, he says every single time when I hear his testimony, I always get touched by this. He says, when he was not Christian, his mother would come to him with the word and say, listen, I want to read to you what God showed me in the Bible. I, I want to I show you what, what God spoke to me in the Bible. And repeatedly he would say, listen, leave from me because I don't want to see you or that Bible ever again. And he, he would say this in, in, his, in his testimony. He said he, remember, he remembers vividly how, how many times he would say this over and over again to his mom when he would be kind of frustrated about Christianity. And then soon enough, those words caught up to him and he became blind. And God struck him with blindness and there was no doctor. He went to specialists and everything. There was no doctor that was able to figure out what happened to his eyes. And then God spoke to him, because you said this and this and this, I strike you with what you said. I strike you with what, and, and he remained blind. I think he's 13 years blind. But God closed this eyes and, and, and opened the eyes of his heart, the spiritual eyes to see God. But this, this comes to, to teach us that what we say or what we speak over ourselves, over our lives has power and authority and brings us to our specific destination. Watch out, young youth. The way that we speak, maybe so loosely, maybe so easily. Because everything is weighed. Maybe the things that we see might become our reality and it is not what we want. The third thing we, we hear, the, the third example we see in uh, James chapter three is that our words, our lips are a consuming fire. And our words have the power to consume. The power to consume. And this is dangerous. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, I think, the most dangerous part of the tongue. The tongue is a fire. The tongue is, is, is like a spark in a forest, he says. And if that spark lights up in the forest, a, a whole forest can be consumed. A whole forest can Imagine camping at Scott's Flat. That whole forest can be consumed by a spark of fire. By a spark of fire. And if we do not, are not careful with our words, and over here I wrote down gossip. I know that's a, it's a very general thing. There was an example once where we were in Arizona and, and um, there was a, a misunderstanding. Uh, someone called my, my, my brother's mother, my, my brother-in-law's mother, and oh, did you hear this guy died, this guy died, and she was just saying these things that she heard. And, and within a couple minutes, it was as if the guy already had his funeral, that he died, he passed away. And yet when you dug into that, it was actually just a joke, a prank. Uh, it wasn't even true. And so fast, maybe in our communities, uh, words can spread, rumors can spread, false things can spread. And that rumors, those things can do so much damage and consume. The words that we say maybe can consume and burn away our friendships, young, young ones. Um, in this life, I realized many things that, that the friends that I, that I had when I was younger, um, if you're not careful with them, by the words that you say, by the things that you do, with the actions that you, that, that, that you, that you do, uh, your friendships can soon be consumed and damaged and never come back. I've had so many good friends that, that when maybe even I was at fault at times, my friendships were consumed. Maybe even in marriages, which I know I'm not experiencing that, but, but little things, little words that can, can chip away and consume relationships and intimate precious things if we are not careful with them. In Exodus, in, in, in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 12, it says, words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. Fools are consumed by their own lips. Uh, when we speak foolishly, when we speak loosely, uh, and we speak without thinking, uh, our lives can be consumed by our words. Our precious things in our lives can be consumed by our words if we are not careful. Uh, and a, a tongue is a fire, and then it is also, uh, in a sense, I, I kind of pulled this out, and I believe that if it is also a fire that sets a blaze of forest, um, I look, kind of researched what happens, because I've seen in Romania too, I've seen people kind of setting on fire fields. And of course, over here, I, I see sometimes uh, kind of controlled fires. Uh, we could also use this mouth not only to consume or, or to ruin relationships, but sometimes we have to profess the truth and be a truthful person to cleanse, to cleanse what is bad and what is rotten uh, and, and, and to clean out the wickedness in order for good things to grow and flourish. We have to be truthful. We have to be honest and, and, and have character as children of God. 
And, and if you, you know exactly why, do you, do you, do young people, do you know exactly why fields are sometimes caught on fire? Or the benefits of fields being caught on fire? It is so that the fire burns out all the weeds, burns out all the, the, the bad plants, the plants that, that keep away from the good plants from growing. They burn them, they consume them, they, they add fertilizer to the dirt, and then what needs to grow, plants that, that, that yield fruit, that yield maybe vegetables, they begin to grow even, even stronger, even more beautiful. Uh, that is why sometimes after a forest fire, the forest grows back even more nicer, even more beautiful, even, even, even more pure. And sometimes in this life, uh, we have the power to consume, but let us not have the power to consume what is good, but the power to consume what is bad. The weeds in our lives. Maybe the bad friends in your lives, you have to uh, confront that with the, with the truth of your lips. Maybe the, the, the bad things that, that we are battling with in our lives. Maybe we are struggling with depression, anxiety. We are struggling with, with, with evil thoughts in our minds. And we have to profess God's truth to consume what is not his. To consume what is of the world. And that God's truth may flourish and grow in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, there is a power to consume and to consume what is bad with the, our lips. Amen. And we see over here um, at the ending of, of chapter three, uh, James comes in and he kind of continues or overflows with the thought of, of speaking as he addresses over there that issue. Who is wise and understanding among you? He talks about now wisdom. Because he starts earlier in this chapter and he says that those who, uh, those who can tame the tongue are perfect. And in a sense, it is another understanding of wisdom, of, 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 of understanding. And over here he says, who then are, are, are wise among you? And over there he was confronting, if we know the context, he was confronting false teachers that were saying, listen, I am a good teacher. Don't listen to these guys. I am the teacher. Listen to me now. Listen only to me. And he says, those guys are full of self-ambition. Those guys are full of jealousy and evil things. That's not wisdom. That's not speaking out of wisdom. And especially in our world, uh, there is so many different understandings of, of what is wisdom. What, is, what, what exactly does it mean for you to be wise? Some people maybe think, well, you know, I have a doctor's degree. I'm a PhD doctor. You know, I'm wise because I've done eight, 10 years of school. You know, I, I confront that maybe even in, in seminary, a lot of times I confront that, well, you know, I'm going for my PhD. And they kind of hold that to them, you know? And it's like, you know, it's good. You know, education is very good, but that is, does that really make you a wise person, a, a PhD? No, no, it doesn't make you a wise person. Uh, is, is true wisdom uh, a wisdom that means that you can win any argument? I know that there's some people, I'm, I remember I, um, back in seminary school, we would have a, a, a kind of a living room area where we would share the living room area, and, and at night sometimes we would get together and we would just start arguing about different theology and different things. And, and you know, there were several people that you knew, oh, those guys are, don't cross them. You know, you start the conversation, just end it and go to your room because those guys will really tear you up, you know, in arguing. But is that true wisdom? Is, is, that, is, that, is that true biblical wisdom, you knowing how to convince somebody or, or, or argue with somebody? No. Uh, is, is true wisdom correlated or, or, or directly related to finances? People say, well, you know, this guy is rich. Obviously, he knows something. This guy has money. This girl has money. Obviously, she's smart. You know what? Uh, there's this thing where the, one of the, the youngest billionaires is a Kardashian, specifically. Man, she's making all kinds of money. But when you look in her life, can you, can you really uh, ask, is she wise? Does she have true wisdom? Yes, she has billions in the bank, but does that correlate with her wisdom, with her understanding? No. We see here in, in James chapter three, true wisdom is pure, is to be pure, is to be gentle, to be merciful, and full of peace. And it repeats two times, peace. To be a peacemaker, to pursue peace, that is true wisdom. And, and I want to, in a sense, conclude my message that we have to watch out exactly how we use our words and how we speak. But if we want to speak in wisdom and if, if we want to speak uh, full of the Holy Spirit and God to lead our words, we must, uh, in a sense, take these things Take this, this, in a sense, direction or this recipe for speaking in wisdom. It is first, uh, speak what is pure. 
Uh, never, never let what is unclean, never let what is, what is of this world come off of your lips. I know it is easy in this generation, this great generation of, of slipping out some, some phrase or some word or maybe, you know, sometimes songs or whatever it is. But, but what is pure must always come out of our mouth and out of our lips. That is what of this world. That we must profess the truth of God. Amen. Amen. To be gentle. This is, a, this is a, a, a good one, to be gentle with our words. Um, some of us are, are very quiet people, but some of us are very loud people. Some of us are very expressive people and passionate people. And, and, and if you know, someone says something, you have a very quick response. Oh, don't, don't say anything. I'll, you know, you know, we, we come from a, 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 a family that you know, is very good with our mouths and very quick with our mouths. And this one really hits home. When we speak, we must speak with gentleness. Uh, to be kind with our words. To be soothing with our words. You know, many times we don't realize that those uh, next to us are hurting and are broken. And we, uh, we just love to just hit them with our words. Hit them with, and we don't think mu much of it. But true wisdom in the way that we speak is speaking gently. Uh, speaking soothly. That, that when someone starts speaking with us, it's as if their heart is healing. As if there's, their, their wounds are healing. That is, that is uh, uh, speaking in gentleness. To be merciful. To be merciful. This is also a big one. Uh, sometimes um, I do this too. When I'm speaking with somebody I don't understand, I get aggravated. You know, or, or, or I don't agree with somebody and I get aggravated. To, but to speak with mercy in a sense. To have mercy to those. There was this, uh, uh, this joke that, that, that Frater Le Puyu kind of told me. And uh, it's a good one. And it's, it's in Romanian, but I'm going to try to translate it in English. It might not be as funny, but I'm, it, still, it still has a powerful point. Uh, a, a, a student asked the teacher, uh, what is the key of, of being wise, of, of, of having wisdom? And he said, never going against a foolish man. And then the, the, the young guy said, well, I don't think that's true. And he says, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> in Romanian, it's a lot funnier, I promise. But in a sense, we must speak uh, with, with mercy, not, not to, okay, I'm going to, you know, you say something to me, well, I'm going to reply with, a, with a, a good one, you know, but to be merciful, to be, in a sense, forgiving with our words. And the last but not least, full of peace. Oh, how, how powerful that is. Like I said before my, in, in, in my uh, first point, that the evidence around us, that the way that we speak is that there's life around us. Well, I pray that Victory Church uh, has the evidence that everything that comes around Victory Church, there is peace. Amen. That if those come with a storm in their lives, they come in Victory Church, and then there, there becomes peace. Amen. If there is a storm, maybe in a relationship or in marriage, they come into this church, and there begins to be peace. Yeah, God begins to work peace. Because what we portray, what we do, what we speak, it is the peace of God wrapped around it. Because we need Him. Amen. Amen. We need Him to touch our lips. And last but not least, an unredeemed tongue is a world of unrighteousness, but a redeemed tongue is a harvest of righteousness. Amen. I pray for this church that, that we may uh, receive a year of harvest, uh, uh, that we may speak in a sense a harvest, that we may have a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of purity, a harvest of gentleness, a, a harvest of mercy, and a harvest of peace with every word that we do, with every word that we say, and everything that we do. May God bless you. Amen.